networks of oscillators. So uh, already from the title, I think you can see a link to uh, all three of the mini courses that we had so far, right? On the first line, you have uh, controllability. On the second line, I'm talking about mixing for stochastic differential equations. And on the third line, I'm hopefully trying to, I'm, I'm going to talk about some models that make sense physically and hopefully are interesting. And so uh, I'm just going to write some the basic equations on the board so that we, we, we can keep them there and uh, you'll have them for all of the talks. So we are in Rn. Uh, Rd, I think, if I want to be consistent. And we have an SDE, so a stochastic differential equation, which is of the form d of xt is f of xt dt. So, so far it's just a, a plain old ODE. And now I add a term, which is sigma uh, times dzt, where Sigma is a linear map from Rn to Rd, and Zt is a random process which lives in, uh, in Rn. So the word degenerate in the title uh, means that uh, I'm not going to assume that n, that n is at least d, right? So n will typically be smaller than d, so the noise is degenerate. It does not act on all degrees of freedoms. That's the analog in sort of infinite dimension uh, of the m strictly smaller than infinity that uh, Professor Cookson had in his uh, PD context. And so uh, I'm interested in mixing. So what that means is I'm, I want to know if there is uh, an invariant measure for this equation if it is unique, and if some generic initial condition, when I let it evolve according to this equation, converges to uh, this invariant measure. So why am I interested in systems of this type, which are essentially finite dimensional analogs of what uh, Professor Cookson was talking about? Well, there are two reasons. The first one is that whenever you do, if you do PDEs and you're trying to do numerics on them, most likely what you'll do is you, you'll project into a finite dimensional thing, right? You'll do Gelderkin uh, uh, projections, so that that becomes a finite dimensional system. Or uh, pretty interesting systems from uh, Hamiltonian physics. So if you have a finite number of masses and springs that are held together, uh, then this will be a finite dimensional system. And there are some interesting physical questions uh, there. I, by now, you should be convinced after the, the two talks by uh, Professor Ekman that there are some interesting questions there. So those are good systems, and, and also I'll, I'll make a short recap of the, what, what I mean when I talk about the networks of oscillators, then I'll move to the abstract setup closer to this, and I'll talk about the method, and the, the, the result and the method. So the result that I'll present is a result that was obtained in collaboration with Vahag and Nersesian, but uh, I, I should also give some uh, credit to Armen Shirikian because I, I, I learned all of this stuff from him uh, during the time that he was uh, in Montreal during my master's thesis. So let us start. This is the simplest thing you can think about. You have L masses. They're all connected to each other by springs, so by linear forces. This is this, uh, no, it's this. Uh, this K times the difference between the, the position of the two masses, right? Q is the position of each mass. And they're also pinned to the ground, so they can't there's no uh, a translation invariant this, that allows the system to just go away to infinity. Uh, this model is pretty simple. In fact, a bit too simple. There are many ways you can deal with this. So what I'm going to do to make things just slightly harder is just add a small nonlinearity to the, to the potential. So I'm not in this. Um, I'm in the case which is harder than linear, but I'm not in the hard, hard case, which is where for example, as you, we see, you get problems when uh, you have different behaviors for the, the pinning and the coupling. If they, they behave like different powers and the power for the coupling is higher, then you can run into problems. I, I won't have this here because both are, are of the same order, right? They're quadratic potentials, so linear force, plus something that grows sublinearly. And what I want to do is study, right? So now the system is conservative. 
So if I want to do talk about mixing and things like that, what I have to do two things. I have to add some noise, but if I add some noise and don't add any dissipation, then everything will just break loose. So I'm looking at this equation where on the first oscillator, I put some dissipation and some noise. Typically in the literature, what you'll see is, is white noise. Um, and I do the same thing on the last oscillator. So the noise is right degenerate. This small n here would be two, right? There are only two degrees of freedom in which the noise acts directly. But nevertheless, right, I'm, I'm not, right, if I make the assumption that no spring is, is broken or anything like that, then somehow you expect the noise to still propagate fairly well through the system to, to have something like some notions of controllability for this system. Okay, so, so from uh, the mini course by, by Professor Eichmann, what we know is that there, there, there's a series of papers uh, which prove existence, uniqueness, and uh, convergence to some invariant measures, invariant measure. And uh, one thing that's to be noted is that uh, as of fairly recently, uh, they are able to deal with uh, geometries which are more complicated than the chain. Right here, each mass just has one, uh, two nearest neighbor at most, except for this one. But they, they can tackle uh, more complex geometries where there you have a complicated networks of, of masses and springs. Uh, of course, they have assumptions there. Uh, so, I mean, this is this an oversimplification, but what they assume is that the network is sufficiently connected for the noise to propagate. So they have this, it's a controllability condition. It's, it's, it's formulated in terms of, of the, the graph of the, the connections between the, the different masses. And, and they, they have some non-degeneracy assumption on, on the interaction, so the coupling potential. Um, their method is, is, is really, it's, those are beautiful results. They allow for the tre treatment of strong linearity, so which is, which is more than, I, than I'm hoping for here. But on the other hand, the, the, the proofs rely on the Gaussian structure of the noise. So you don't ex expect this, this exact same method to, to carry through if you change the nature of the noise. And so what, I'm, what I want to do is, is tell you about the, the coupling and, and controllability approach for such system, which, which will work even for noises that are very far from being uh, white noise. So, so so different types of noises, which are not usually treated in, in uh, literature. So that's as I said, maybe you want, you want right, what, what the white noise does in an equation like this, if you think about, uh, I mean, the early works of, um, of Einstein and, and Brown and Langevin and, and whatever, right? It's, it's mimicking the fact that there's this particle in the medium that's getting kicked. And, and, and in some approximation, right, you can model that by, by white noise. And, but white noise is an approximation. And I'm going to be interested in actually considering kicks. So I'll consider a, a, some sort of compound Poisson process type noise. So where there's no noise for a while, and then the particle gets kicked. And then there's no noise for a while, maybe not, not the same duration of time, and then it get, gets kicked around again. And so this is a perfectly fine SDE as far as we're concerned, and, and I'm interested in, in dealing with that. Oh, no. L is fixed. Yeah, yeah. L, L or, or in the abstract set of my, my dimension here. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not claiming that I can control things well as, as the dimension goes to infinity. Okay, and, and not only are they not Gaussian, these, these random kicks at random times, they're, they're not, or at least not obviously, decomposable in the sense of the lecture by uh, Professor Cookson, right? This, this writing in, in the basis where you have independent uh, coefficients in the basis. It's not clear that you have that here, so we, you have to adapt a bit the, even the approach from there. And the kind of assumptions that I want to make, right, the, the sort of qualitative uh, features of this network, as I said, is that there is some dissipativity. If you let the system evolve without noise, it will sort of relax to near the center, right? Maybe not quite to zero, zero because there's this, 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 this nonlinear term here, which is small, but still the, the overall behavior is that if, if you try to go far, you'll be brought back near the center. 
What? Think bounded. I can do a bit more than bounded, something that grows that one over, I don't know if it's twice or four times the dimension, but. Uh, what? No, I just mean that it's, it, its growth is not comparable to the linear. Think, think bounded, but not small. OK? And there's this sort of very naive notion of controllability saying that everyone's connected to everyone through the spring. So there should be some good propagation. Uh, because I'm close to the harmonic case, which is, but I'll, I'll be more rigorous on, on what that means here. I'll, I'll make precise uh, conditions. So as I said, the, the real abstract setup is this. I have an SDE. So the noise is injected from a, from a small dimension to a big dimension by some linear map. I'm going to make dissipative assumptions, which are behavior about f at infinity. I want it to point inwards. And I'll make uh, assumptions on the properties of the images of the solution map and its derivatives in the noise, right? So that's, that's really the, the same notion as controllability, of controllability that, that we had in the, in the mini course. OK? So that's the SDE. Uh, just to introduce a, a, a bit of notation that, that comes in handy uh, when you do these things. The SDE, we say that it, uh, it generates, I mean, it induces a, a semi-group on the space of uh, Borel probability measures, right? Uh, you can think of, I mean, I can write down the definition. It's simply, so if I have P, T star of, say, the simplest example is a Dirac mass. So if I have an initial condition which is concentrated in one point, and I'll make it evolve, then this is the probability that if you start it in X and wait time t, you're somewhere, right? This is just what it means. And then in the general case, you just integrate with respect to your initial condition. Uh, so yeah. So if I apply this to a set gamma here, then the gamma goes there. And then uh, lambda dx. I'm assuming that my, my noise is nice enough that, that this all makes sense. It works. OK, and my question is, oh, that one. Uh, is there a, a measure which just does not change under this evolution? And if I take an initial condition that's not too bad, then does it converge to my invariant measure? I say not too bad because I think if, if lambda is such that uh, it does not have a first moment or things like that, then our result does not really carry through, but for some, for a large class of lambda, this, this will work. For example, anything that's supported on a compact or, or has, I think, a first or second moment. Uh, anyway, okay. And when I talk about convergence here, I will not use the dual Lipschitz norm, but I'll use total variation, which is, uh, which was also introduced in the mini course. And I just have one slide on, of comments on, on this notion of, of convergence, and it's the following. So there are different ways you can define it. One, one that I like is define it, defining it as the, so you look at the average it can give to some bounded measurable functions, and you take the worst one. You divide by two so that it stays between zero and one. That's my notion of, of distance between two probability measure. And now there's this, this nice lemma, which was also referred to in, uh, it was stated in terms of random variable. Here I, I stated in terms of measure, but uh, it's really the same. So what it's saying is, if you want to know what's the total variation distance between two measures. So say you have, uh, so I'm going to, right, so this says you, you go to uh, twice the space. So if I have a measure on R that looks like this, is this big enough? Yeah. Okay, and, and another one, right, which is on another copy of R, a priori, which looks like, I don't know, something like this. Then to know what's the total variation distance between this thing and this thing, you ask, now I work in the square, right, the product of the two spaces, and I ask, 
can I define a measure on the square, which has the right projections and has as much, as much weight as possible on the diagonal? So if the two measures are the same, right, it's like this and it's the same here, then you can put all the weight on the diagonal. It will have the right projections and you'll have a lot of weight on the diagonal. So this, you will find a P, right, something on the square, which gives zero weight to the complement of the diagonal. So the total variation distance is zero, right? They're the same measure. If the measures have, have disjoint support, then there's no way you can put anything on the diagonal because it would have to project to, to this, this thing. So it's, it's a way of thinking about uh, distance between measures as how much weight you can put on the diagonal when you try to couple them. Okay? And this minimum is, is uh, it is achieved, right? We saw that in the lecture too. There is such a maximal coupling, so one that puts as much weight as possible on the diagonal. Okay, so now the question is, why am I talking about couplings? What, what does it have to do with mixing? And the answer is seen through, through a basic lemma or maybe a proposition about convergence of, of Markov chains on, on compact phase spaces, which is, I mean, I, I don't know who I should attribute this to maybe, I mean, it goes back to ideas of, of Dublin and, and people like that. So it says that if you have a discrete time Markov family on a compact phase space, if there's a small number, so something between zero and one such that, when you look at the evolution of Dirac masses in two different points in one time step, then this is always bounded by some number which is strictly less than one then you have a unique invariant measure and you have exponential convergence. So, so really when, when I say the total variation distance between these things, it's really about, it's a total variation of between the, the transition functions in, in, in time step one. So how do you prove this? Well, through couplings, that, that's, that's why I'm talking about this. Well, th th there are two proofs of this actually. Uh, I think in Armen, uh, in Professor Shirikian's and, and Cookson's book on uh, on two D turbulence, there's uh, of, on turbulence there are these these two proofs, and the first one is is just an, an argument sort of abstract about contractions, and the second one uses coupling, and and that's where you get the insight that I want to tell you about. So it's an existence and uniqueness theorem. Uh, well, the existence part is is not so bad because you're in a compact space. Uh, the space of probability measures on a compact space with a different topology, right? It's compact, so it's sequentially compact. So, so to sort of engineer uh, an invariant measure is a, is a classical argument that goes by the name of uh, bogolyubov krylov So I'm gonna, not going to spell it out, but because of compactness, you have existence. Now what about uniqueness? Well, this, this is maybe a, a big block of text, but it's, it's, we've seen this idea before. If I want to I know a priori, right, that, that transition functions get close to each other. So I can construct a random variable for, for any initial condition. So I sorry, I should have mentioned. I work on, on twice the space as we did before. And I construct a random variable there, which depends on initial conditions. And the prop properties that it has is that if I project onto one of the comp components, y, right, pi projects into this one and pi prime projects into this one, if I look at the distribution of this random variable, only its first coordinates, then it looks like the measure in, I'm in, one of the measures I'm interested in. And if I look at the other projections, it looks like the other measure I want to compare. And it has this nice property that um, the probability that, I, that the thing does not hit the diagonal is at most gamma. So I can do that by, because the total, total variation distance is the nth overall coupling, I can find a coupling which, which, which does that. And I proceed inductively. I make, take many copies of this randomness and I define a process inductively. So I, 
first take my initial conditions, and then to go from step k to step k plus one, I sort of use this coupling. Uh, sorry, there, there should be a pi here. Sorry. Zk plus one you take as the first component of this map, and Zk prime you take as the second component of this map. And then you can check, right, that this new, what, what you've created is you've now, you have a process which is like this. Um, and if you look at the distribution of the first component, it has the, f the first distributions as the original process and the same for the second. And the probability that uh, the, the two components never meet each other is exponentially small because at each step I'm sort of optimizing for them to meet. So the probability that they never meet is pretty small. And so, right, the probability that Zk is not equal to Z prime k is small, but that forms a coupling for, uh, right, if you have this, then because this has the distribution of, oh, sorry, this is a k, starting in x, and this as the distribution like this, right, those x and x prime are the initial conditions for that process, then you know that this thing's in total variation is small. Because you've managed to create a coupling which often hits, which has a lot of weight on the diagonal. Okay, so that's the idea. The idea is you want to prove mixing. Uh, so, you're trying to double the space, create a process there which often hits the diagonal. And that's, that's sufficient to prove that uh, evolutions of Dirac masses get close together. But then if you, right, if you integrate this equation in x with respect to the invariant measure which you know, is, you know exists, and this one with respect to some other measure, you get that the distance between the in target invariant measure and the evolution of your initial conditions is also small. Does that make sense? I think so. But, so this is the, the first lemma that I, that I talked about. If, if you have a uniform upper bound on the variational distance between evolutions of Dirac masses, then you can prove exponential mixing. But uh, this is a bit ambitious, right? Uh, getting a bound like this, which is uniform in all x and x prime, uh, is not necessarily reasonable, especially if x is not compact, right? So this worked in, in compact spaces, but you, you can always hope to, to, to apply this theorem to any, old, any situation you're interested in. So there's a second lemma, which is sort of slightly more sophisticated version of, of this idea. So it still goes through a coupling. And it's that if you have this, this estimate only in, a, in some set, but the time you need to wait to get into this set does not have too big a, 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 of a tail, then you're good to go. You have exponential mixing. And, and the idea is, is the following. You want to create something on, on twice the space. So at first, if they're far and from B and, and they're not equal, then you just let them be independently. And the time you have to wait for them to enter this B is not too large. Well, maybe at first only one of them will enter in B, but if, and then it'll go out and then go in. But if you, if you wait a little more and have good at, you have good at estimates on how long you need to wait, then both of them will be there. And once they're both there, you, you sort of do version of, of the previous lemma. And then you're, you're, you can show that uh, there, there's a good probability that they, it hits the diagonal, right? that the two components are equal. And then you have esti estimates like this, and then you can, you can prove exponential mixing.
Now, so, so I've introduced, there, there, was, there were two main words in, in the first line of my title. It was a coupling and controllability approach. So that was the coupling part. Now, why controllability? Why controllability is, is important in this business? Well, it's because in those two lemmas, right, you need an, an upper bound on, on the difference. And to get an upper bound on the difference, it's sufficient to get a common lower bound, right? Because if this measure is lower bound, bounded by something, and this thing also lower bounds this one, then you can at least put that on the diagonal. It will have the right projections, and it, it, won't, it won't be a problem. So the idea is that if you want to prove a bound on, on the difference, well, you can just prove a common lower bound, which hold for all x near some point or in some small set. And how do you do that? Well, that's where controllability comes in. The, the, the measure which you obtain by evolving a delta, what it is, it's, it's just the push forward of the law of the noise through the solution map, right? We've seen this in the other mini course. So you have You have a space for the noise, which is very big. And you have the solution map, which I call S, say, T, X dot. So it takes an initial condition and a control here. And it gives you a point in, in your, uh, well, I'm working in Aryan, so maybe I shouldn't draw anything compact. But uh, I don't know the, the plane. And that's. The image of this map is once you chose that control, right? you solve the ODE, and then you get a, a point at time t, and that's what it maps to. So you have a law here on the controls, right? the law of the noise. Call it L. I think I called it L. I'm, I'm, we'll see. Uh, then the law of the solution is just the push forward of this measure through the map. So. If you think back to, to basic calculus and in, in integral calculus, right? If you want to push a, uh, a measure through a nice map, uh, you can do it via a change of variable if you have a, a nice Jacobian, if the Jacobian is nice, right? If, if, this Jacobian of the, if the Jacobian of this map has full rank, then, then you can do essentially a change of variable and, and you can get a handle on, on the push forward of the measure. And that's the whole idea. Right, the controllability conditions were, were conditions on this, this having full rank, or, or without the D just hit uh, covering a ball. And so if it covers a ball, then by, by Sach's theorem, you can find a point where the derivative has, has full rank and things like that. So that's essentially the idea. And now in, in the lemma, there was this other condition that uh, the time to, to hit that ball where you have where you have good estimates on that should not, should not be too large. It should decay exponentially. Well, this is closely related to the notion of approximate controllability to the center of V. Right? If, if the system is uh, controllable to B, then there, there exists a lot of control that take you there. And then if the law here is nice, then you, you get a lower bound on the probability of going into the set B. So that's the idea. So now I, I'm ready to present the, the main result, which was obtained with Vahag uh, and Nersesian. So it is, if you have an SDE and RD of this form, the form that I talked about, and this process here is a n-dimensional Poisson process with some distribution with, for the jumps that has a positive continuous density with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And you have a dissipativity assumption. And two controllability conditions. So there exists one point, one point in the phase space to which the system is approximately controllable and from which the system is solidly controllable. Then you have exponential mixing. So uh, a few remarks. Uh, this noise is unbounded. It's not Gaussian. But because of the, the Poisson structure, there's still a a way to reduce it to the discrete time problem and still get good estimates. So that's what we did in the paper. 
So I, I just maybe if if people are not sure what I'm what I'm uh, referring to with with that type of noise, it's it's really I have a random function here, which is of this form. So there's a sequence of waiting times, which are i i d and distributed according to an exponential law. And I have a sequence of jumps, which are also i i d with some distribution, which is nice, right? I'm assuming it has a positive continuous density with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Then my nose is of this form. It's, it's nothing. Then at time tau k, which is just uh, tau 1, which is just t1, it jumps by eta 1. Then at time tau 2, which is t1 plus t2, the time you have to wait for the second kick, it jumps again, but now by eta 2. And this eta 2 is also random. So at random times, you're kicked in, in random directions. So because of that, you can rewrite the, the random dynamical system in this way. If you want to know at time t small what happens, then you just, there's no kick yet, so you just evolve with zero, zero control. And when you hit the time of a kick, then you just add it. So this has, has a nice enough structure that we, we, can, we can estimate things properly. And I want to just recall the definition of uh, solid controllability and approximate um, controllability. So there's this distinguished point x hat in the phase space. Yeah, and this is my assumption on distribution on jumps. So there's this distinguished point x hat. There's a number, small. There's a time. There's a compact set in this space of continuous functions. And a non-degenerate ball g in Rn, such that if I have a function which well approximates my solution map on that compact set, then this function covers a ball. Okay, so why this condition? It goes back to this picture here. This picture here, what you want to do is you want to do a change of variable. So you want this map to have a uh, full rank Jacobian. So the way to obtain a full rank Jacobian is usually applying some version of South's theorem. But turns out that because of the arguments, a lot of times you don't just need this map to cover a ball, but also some small perturbations of that map to still cover a ball so that you can carry all, all of the analysis through. So this is the notion of solid controllability. It, I think Professor uh, Akrachev ta talked about this notion in, in, in the main course. And the other assumption is that the system is approximately controllable to x hat. So in a compact, if, if you're in, in a ball of regis R and you allow yourself some time, enough time, then you can approximately reach x hat from any point in, in, the, in the big ball. So that again should, this is the kind of thing that will ensure that you, you hit near this point's x hat where you have the squeezing estimates. So we proceed in three, three steps for the, for the theorem. As I said, you, you first want to reduce to a discrete time problem. Uh, then you want to construct a coupling for the discrete time problem. And then you want to come back to the continuous time problem uh, steps one and two are, I mean, you have, you have to write things down, but I don't think there's, I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. And the trick is how you construct that coupling. And it, it has a similar flavor to what was uh, done for the, those uh, PDEs that we had uh, this morning. So, this construction has to depend on some integer m, which is sort of the number of kicks you have to wait for one time, like one time step, because, because the dimension where the kicks happen is much smaller. You, you can't expect in one kick to get wherever you want. But if you, you sort of allow for uh, many different kicks intertwined with free evolutions, then, then you sort of, you can hit more places. So m, m is large enough that if you have different kicks, 
and, and free evolution in between them, then you have good uh, attainability properties. So this M has to, has to be chosen in, in a nice way. But anyway, so if your, your coupled process, the, the two coordinates are different and not both in B, then you just let them evolve independently until they hit B. We have good control on the time wait. you have to wait for that. And once they're both in B, you do a very similar construction to what was done in this lemma one. And then you can guarantee that they will uh, coincide after some time. And then they will coincide forever. And so where each of the controllability conditions come, come in is, is in the following way. So there are three steps, right? This is my whole, my whole phase space. I have a, a big compact, which is the ball of radius r. Then I have a little neighborhood of x hat. So if both z and z prime are far and different, then I wait. And because of the dissipativity, right, the fact that f points inwards, they'll eventually both be inside this compact. Then inside this compact, because of uh, uh, approximate controllability, I can estimate the time they need for both to enter this ball near x hat. And then from x hat, I use solid controllability to make sure that they eventually coincide. And that gives me total variation estimates for the, the, the difference between uh, evolved measures. Yeah, so, so that's what's written here. That's, that's the potential of the proof. Then, of course, there, there are some estimates you have to carry out. But I, I hope I sort of gave the, the main ideas for the abstract result. And now I have about, do I have 10 or 20, 30, 20 minutes. Uh, I want to go back to the more concrete model and maybe explain uh, how you would go about proving these, uh, these conditions for, for the concrete model. So the first thing you do is you want to you want to rewrite the system in this form. And so what you do is is you write uh, do I want I might want p here. Then q dot It's going to be a sketch of the form that it has because it has a lot of ones and zeros, but just, just to give you an idea. There's a gamma one here, then there are a bunch of zeros, then there's a minus gamma L. All right, that's the dissipation terms. P dot, the first one is minus P, the second one. Here you have, wait, how do you do this? You do Q dot should be equal to P. So that's, um, all right, I put uh, dot Q dot, sorry. Ah. <laughs> anyway, I think, I think if I put this here, then I know how it goes. It goes like this, and then there's, no, there's omega star, and then omega, and then you probably have a zero here. Uh, Right, then I have plus a small, no, not a small, but a sublinear term. And then I have plus a matrix which looks like uh, then a bunch of zeros and sigma n and uh, no, it's an L. 
and then lots of zeros. applied to some noise, OK? Where omega star and omega, right, or should I say omega star omega is a matrix which encodes the, the, all the, the, the kappas and the k's. And, and the, it's a matrix which has a bunch of the square root of the, of the kappas and the k's. And so how do you ensure that such a system uh, has good controllability properties? Well, maybe I shouldn't. Ah. Well, you first focus on the linear part, and you have this, this so-called Kalman condition, which we, uh, I don't think we talked about it in the mini-course, but um, if you, this is one of the Ks that we saw in the mini-courses, actually, right? It's, it's a fixed vector field plus a linear combination of some controls. And what you do if you want to check controllability properties, one way to do it is to compute Lie brackets of this constant, constant vector fields with, with these constant. What? Yeah, sorry, this linear vector field with, which, with, with this constant one. But, but computing Lie brackets for something linear and something constant is pretty easy. It's just, it's just product of matrices. You can compute that. And there's a rank condition on, on the product of matrices. So you can check that without the sublinear terms, it has good controllability properties. And then, because this is really sublinear, and, and if you ensure, if you put the right conditions on the, the sublinear term, then these controllability properties will, will be preserved. So, so at, at the heart of, of the study of this model is, is the study of the linear case. And that's why with this model, I cannot do a, a Q to the 4 or things like that that uh, the, the, the people in Geneva were, were about to do. Because at the heart of the, the controllability arguments, there, there's the study of the linear case, which is very well known. I mean, people have worked on the linear case for, for ages, and, and a lot of knows, is known about it. So it's the basis of the analysis. And, and again, this so-called Kalman condition on this matrix with this matrix is related to, to how the springs are connected and things like that. So, so physically, it, it makes sense, but I cannot do the, the, the other order of potentials other than quadratic. So that's essentially all I wanted to say. So thank you for your attention. And